All right, everybody. We are ready to get started. Everybody should be able to screen the, see this PowerPoint uh, screen right now. Let me see if I can oops, figure out my participant view tab. If somebody wants to give a thumbs up or a quick comment to confirm that they can see that, that would be great. I'll ask Chris Cervante, can you see it? Thank you very much, Chris. Good, thanks guys. Okay, so uh, to get started, I'm Dr. Brian Garrity, uh, Director and Professor of uh, Master of Art and Sport Coaching Degree at the University of Denver. Um, there's our contact information of how to find us on social media and, and email links. Uh, title of our talk today is just the Strength Conditioning Coach Development Chat. Uh, like a good strength coach, I've basically lost my voice from too many Zoom meetings and, and administrative meetings. I feel like I've been coaching all day. Um, this meeting is being recorded. So we'll find a way to share it with you guys afterwards. I do have everybody's microphone muted intentionally right now uh, because I control all the power and I don't want to hear from you. That's a joke. Um, but if you guys want to comment in the uh, chat box, that's great. We'll have some opportunities along the way, especially at the end. We've, we've made some time at the end to have some discussion, dialogue about what we're going to talk about today too. Okay. Um, Chris, you want to go ahead and then I'll do the first poll. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Chris Zedlack. Uh, I'm an academic and uh, lead, uh, SNC lead at the University of Southampton in, in the UK. Uh, and that's basically it, really. And uh, what we're doing today is in, the, in this chat is we really want to just looking at, look at the theory, the history of strength and conditioning and what the problem is or what, if, if there is a problem and what practice looks like currently. So we know we, we, it's just an, a nice introduction um, of, of laying the ground um, of what theory, uh, history, and problem and practice looks like today. So that's going to be our chat today. So it's going to be quite exciting. All right. I just checked. I messed up the poll thing. I messed up the poll. I had it on the, uh, on the previous uh, link. So the Zoom has not got my poll ready to go, uh, which just sounds typical for me. So... Yeah, whatever. Uh, the question, guys, though, too, is if you want to put it in the chat box, you know, uh, was what is your undergraduate degree in? So if you guys want to take a second, you know, I, I had on the poll, I figured it would be exercise and sports science, strength conditioning, perhaps, uh, physical education, kinesiology, some type of combination or something else. So as we're doing that, I'll put in mine as well. And then just kind of give us a feel for right, like who's in the room, but also then where, where do we come from? You know, and what's your uh, orientation? And as we look at some of the theory and the history, like Chris talked about, it'll help kind of make sense of, you know, why do we kind of see these answers the way that we do? So yeah, pretty typical stuff here. Uh, so real quick, so you guys know who we are, because we we realize there's a bunch of people on this chat that uh, don't really know us or um, our background. So. Uh, currently, right, I'm a professor here at the University of Denver. Uh, it's a pretty nice place. I direct our master's degree, teach our sport coaching program, a certificate in strength conditioning and psychology of coaching. I've uh, been here since 2014. Uh, but prior to that, I was a professor at the University of Southern Miss in a similar, similar -ish program, uh, but also coached high school football. And actually, this place here is called Purvis High School, a school of about 550 kids. Uh, it's a 4A school, so it's kind of a, a somewhat of a larger school for down in that area. Uh, prior to that, I was a strength coach at the University of Tennessee with football and baseball for the most part. I worked with a couple other sports at times. Uh, but yes, uh, for our friends in the UK and around the world, this is what a typical football game looks like at Tennessee with about 105,000 people, uh, much like your guys' soccer matches or football matches over there. Uh, prior to that, I was a student athlete. I played football at John Carroll University, a small D3 school. Uh, and then I was a power lifter as well. Um, in my teenage years, uh, not too bad. And then I did an internship my last couple of years in college in, uh, with the Cleveland Indians baseball team. So in reverse order, that's how I became a strength coach, professor, football coach, uh, power lifter. I've uh, been lifting weights since I was about 12, 13 years old and, and, and just love it. Uh, but obviously now I, with this work that I do, I'm more of a social scientist. Um, and interesting, and Chris as well, I think, right? Being a a social scientist, a learning theorist, a developmental person, 
in uh, a, a highly uh, scientific, you know, biology, physiology, biomechanics kind of based field. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a bit about myself. Um, before I became uh, the lead SNC coach at the University of Southampton, um, I, uh, I am and I was still a, a Christian pastor, so I run churches for quite a long time before that. Uh, and I became um, an SNC coach because I like exercise. Um, so, Brian, if you want to click it through. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the, a, at, the, at the university, um, I'm in charge of the, uh, the, um, uh, the bursary uh, for the elite athletes. And so that basically means all the elite, uh, everyone who is of a higher standard can apply to it. So I, I'm, I'm working with multi-sports. Uh, I work with disability sports like uh, GB Go Ball. Um, the next one would be... Uh, uh, Netball, and then the next one, as an example, uh, Taekwondo. But there are plenty, plenty of, of, of sports that I've worked with from a vast variety um, because uh, we get a vast variety of athletes. And they are of elite level, European world champion, Olympic level. And they come to us and uh, we work with them. One of the, the, uh, the majority of my work is with the, with the British sailing team. So I've worked with the British sailing team uh, and with uh, some of their uh, uh, athletes over the last um, 13 years. Um, and uh, a lot of the athletes that I work with have gone on to Olympic level um, and uh, have won medals, uh, medals everywhere. Uh, so I recently uh, graduated last year uh, with my PhD from the University of uh, Chichester. Um, and five years ago when I started my PhD, uh, when I had the question about looking at psychosocial behaviors in, in SNC and strength and conditioning, um, uh, I, I got some very weird looks and a lot of people wouldn't really thinking that that was a necessary research question but i persevered and uh, eventually uh, graduated i'm also a, um, a tutor and assessor uh, for the uk strength and conditioning association so um, I, I tutor all of their courses um, uh, all of the technical courses and also the sports science uh, applied for sports science co 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 course and i also um, assess um, the uh, proposed candidates so that's for me, really. Um, I, love, I love lifting, I love surfing, I love skating, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I, what I really do like even more is uh, to uh, do research in, uh, uh, in, 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 in social, uh, in, in, in coach development. So, I mean, you know, I often think, what, what is the problem? We often think that, uh, is there actually a problem? In strength and conditioning, we, we looked at it and uh, um, what does it mean? You know, is, is, what, what does strength and conditioning mean? I think what defining the problem is really important and actually thinking about, first of all, looking at what is the problem for coach developers? Uh, are coach developers including strategies that focus on, the, on needs and, and skills? That, for example, in, that that that, um, um, that encourage um, us to be effective in a social interaction. As you can see, that from this picture, every aspect of strength and conditioning is a social interaction, and and that's really important to understand. We take this for granted. Um, we take it for granted as 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 coaches because some of us are good at it and some of us are not good at it. But some, the, the, the people who are good at it take it for granted. But it's a social interaction, and how can we be effective? Or can SNC coaches be effective without these skills? So can SNC coaches be an effective coach without being effectively interacting in a social situation with the athletes? And this is, this is the, the, the problem or the situation that, that myself and Brian and the few others are asking ourselves is, it, can we, or is it necessary? Is there something missing in coach development that focus on these that, 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 that needs to focus on these skills that enhance this social interaction that we have um, with the athlete. Brian, have you got anything to add for that? Uh, well, I mean, right, part of what we're doing in the chat today is to talk about some of just the ideas and things that you uh, others have been working on. I can see them on the on the call here too. You know, it's pointing out, like you said, that strength conditioning is a social interaction. 
that this right here is not just observing, right? If you want to use the word observing or perhaps he's getting ready to give feedback or a cue, but there's also more ways of looking at this social interaction too. He's also perhaps judging this guy, right? He's judging the quality of the movement. He's judging the quality of his body. He's judging the quality of his character, his heart, his mindset. You know, the, the coach is doing a lot of these things, but we sometimes don't have the skills or the language to talk about it uh, with typical strength conditioning education being focused. Uh, and if you look in the chat, right, sport and exercise science was the dominant thing. Uh, and we'll break this down a little bit further. Uh, so it's pointing out the social interaction and all of the different things that can be going on in this space. You know, same thing here, right? This is not a, again, an objective or neutral space. Equipment is spaced apart in certain ways. There are certain areas to perform your movements, right? And, and some of this, we explain it by safety, by standards, but we want to critically evaluate and critically think about all those things. And we want to do it with research and theory uh, to understand our practice better uh, because theory practice and all that goes together at the same time. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's not a theory practice divide, okay? One of the, this is, this is a really, I, I, I'm sure that anybody in coach, in coach development or looking at effective coaching practice um, has come across this uh, definition from Cody and Gilbert. And I'm not going to read it out, but it's, it's, it, it's, been, it's been referenced so many times. Uh, it's, it's part of the, the backbone of the ICC uh, framework. Um, and it is, it is, a, it is, a, great, it is a, it's a great definition. And I think we have to understand that we need to, first of all, um, classify uh, strength and conditioning as a profession. And that is a really important thing. Strength and conditioning is a coaching profession. When we look at some of the NSCA, UKCA, SCA, ASCA uh, mission statements, and, and we see that we are in a coaching profession. Fairly, well, in, the, in the UK, a fairly new coaching profession in, in comparison to some other professions, but it is a profession. So if it's a coaching profession and we want to be effective, we've got to adopt some of these elements that, um, that, that this, this uh, 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 coaching Gilberts are, are bringing out. And we're looking especially at integrated professional. So we look at the professional knowledge. Um, that's, that we get, we get it everywhere, especially in strength and conditioning biophysical technological knowledge it's focused upon. Then we have interpersonal interpersonal knowledge to improve us with competence, confidence, connection, character, and specific sporting con uh, coaching context. So basically what it means, we're looking after the whole of the, the athlete, the whole of the well-being. This, this definition is a, it's a, it's a fairly good definition and we can, we can look at it, we can analyze it and say, okay, well, yes, and see um, education is really much, very much taking care of the um, professional knowledge but what about the interpersonal, interpersonal knowledge to improve athletes' competent connection, character, and so, which we call a holistic development of the athlete. So I think, yeah, leave it there. So I, my, my take, you know, Chris said profession, and, and, and we're intentionally not going to agree on everything, and, and we've designed it that way, uh, not to, like, be competitive, but to be more critical about it and just think about it, that I actually don't, I don't think strength conditioning or, or coaching in general is basically a profession. I think it's a quasi-profession. When you look at, again, typical standards for professions about knowledge, health and safety, or public regulation, ethics, licensure, regula regulation, regulation of the profession, strength conditioning is loose. Uh, coaching is loose, depending on what character. It kind of meets some of these kind of typical standards. It talks about it, and we like to say it, uh, and it sounds nice, and everybody wants to be taken as a professional because you know, it's nice for your ego uh, and you don't want to be taken as uh, like the, you know, the, the, well, the, well, like the Instagram coach that's kind of clueless. We'll, we'll, we'll bad mouth those people. Um, right. We have to juxtapose, well, I'm a true professional. Yeah, but it's not a profession. Right. So it didn't really meet those kind of standards. Uh, and same thing, this is a nice definition. I don't like nice definitions either. I don't like them. Um, I think they're too nice. I think they kind of get us to be like nodding our head, and if you, nowadays, you know, academics love to use alliteration, competence, competence, connection. Let's have some more C's. 
uh, and, and throw in some care, caring as well. Uh, it, it, again, like it sounds good and if they have some utility to them and I'm, and I'm teasing, but I'm being a little bit provocative to uh, say like, do we really need all these definitions? And are these the, the psychosocial outcomes that we wanna have? Uh, where, in, as well as the performance outcomes? And do coaches have to do all of these things at all times? And who uses these things and for what purposes? Yeah, I, I must, I agree with, with part of what you're saying, especially with regards to when we look at this definition, it's, it's a, it, looks, it looks very polished. It looks very polished. But is, it, is that really what a, what a coach in an elite context does? Or is that really what athletes in the elite context want of a coach? Um, I mean, I've, um, I've, I've recently watched, uh, maybe some of you have done this, uh, the, the, the series The Last Dance which is, uh, for me, which was, was a really nice series about uh, the Chicago Bulls and how they were managed, how they were coached. Um, now, if I apply some of these, uh, some of these uh, um, characteristics that, that were in this definition to some of the coaching that I've observed in the last dance, then I would say that it wasn't effective, but it was effective. And it was on, not only effective in a way of bringing team success, but it was also effective to taking the individual characteristics of the athlete into account and push them to, to the success that they wanted to be part of. So it's very, it's very easy to say we need, to, we need all of this, but applying it in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an elite environment is quite difficult. I'm looking for the opposite. I was going to type up that one thing about like satisfaction. Uh, the definition of coaching effectiveness you know, back in the day was often framed around athlete satisfaction or athlete preference. Yeah. And part of that came from uh, the literature on, from Cello Durai and others on leadership, and they took it from business uh, organizational theory. And so that's where you get satisfaction or preference literature. And it makes sense in the context of consumer behavior to satisfy your customer. But again, like, you know, as a coach, are you sitting there thinking about, and maybe you should though, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but are you concerned with the satisfaction of your athletes? Are you concerned with their preferences? If you meet their preferences, do they participate longer? Do they have better outcomes? Uh, or are you reading that stuff and just kind of going like, yeah, okay, you know, like I allow some decision-making and generally nice behavior. So just dropping where that comes from. Yeah, absolutely. So I know I have, if you guys want to punch it in the chat, the, set, the second poll here question was, how many courses have you had specific to psychosocial issues of uh, coaching you know, or, or strength conditioning practice? So from a formal education, you know, I was thinking university standpoint, how many classes have you had that are specific to psychosocial issues? So if you guys care to, you can pop that into, yeah. You know, there's one, a few. Yeah. So MASC is a master arts sport coaching program. Alex is one of our students here. All right. Phil, we talked about Phil in your second. Phil's a scholar professor too, right? With zero classes. And he's writing about these things. I think somebody here turned on the blender. So here are our two pictures. Uh, we got biophysical. We're going to call this biophysical technological knowledge. So this is biology, physiology, biomechanics, nutrition, you know, and technology. And then over here, we're for the sake of simplicity, just going to say like psychology, philosophy, uh, sociology, cultural studies, arts and humanities are going to be a psychosocial. Okay. And of course, these things go together and they interact, but we're just going to say like, right, like most of strength conditioning is biophysical, technological. And then uh, much of what we're talking about today too is going to be psychosocial. And we want to identify how this came to be, right? How is it that uh, this uh, is kind of the dominant way of looking at the field, uh, that this is really pro predominant and then this is kind of somewhat marginalized? Um, I think the, uh, the, um, the big kind of information is that, that you know, like out of, uh, within, within NSCA, UKCA and ACA, all of the workshops that they run, I think they run 62 workshops, um, which are scheduled. And it's only six of them that look at what, what we call functional competence, which is like the how of doing things, which might include some psychosocial competencies. And it's only the UK SCA who've, um, who've, who've done the uh, applied coach science workshop, which referenced something like reflection or like 
um, address it to, to, to slide a little bit. And so there's, there are not a lot, an awful lot of opportunities for uh, SNC coaches to go to, on a workshop that is focused on psychosocial behaviors um, and characteristics and how to develop them. So there are at the currently in the curriculum, there are no, no opportunities. So, yeah. Uh, additionally, let's see what else we get here. So, you know, one of the things that happens, and I'll explain it, is a sociological concept called the Matthew effect. Uh, the Matthew effect is uh, quite old. It comes from Merton's work back, I believe, like the 50s, 60s, if I remember correctly. But the Matthew effect is how some scientists become well known uh, and nowadays to the point of becoming famous. Uh, but the Matthew effect kind of explains how certain folks get more credit uh, than maybe other folks and their scholarship and their personality grows and grows and grows. And it related nowadays, I believe, to like what I would call consumer culture, you know, kind of capitalism too. That between the webinars, you know, and the websites and the social media and presentations and books, everybody is trying to produce something and make a brand out of themselves. You hear that kind of talk too. So we start to kind of think about uh, and have buzzwords and phrases to describe these things. And I'm friends with uh, colleagues with uh, several of these people. Uh, and they're friends with very many more. And, and part of that is, right, being networked and connected to promote yourselves, uh, to promote your product so you can sell more types of things. And people use this science and they use their products to profit from it, you know, from fame, from fortune, um, notoriety, and, and just having more influence or more power upon other people as well. And so even with this and with ourselves, you know, I like to talk about critiquing those things and continuously kind of thinking and problematizing as a way of, you know, why am I exposed to this now? And you think about strength conditioning, you can make it more specific than the individuals, but you can look at how back in the 80s, powerlifting was massively popular. You know, then it became Olympic weightlifting as a movement. Then it became, you know, technology and GPS and heart rate monitoring. And now it's even more. Now it's even more um, with uh, different devices and, and uh, accelerometers and things to constantly test people. So we can think about how the people and the knowledge get produced and kind of become well known and kind of take up space in our thought process. And this influences how we think about the, uh, our practice and our, our world of strength conditioning. I think that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good point really because, um, and, and, and out of that, the, um, we, we can see that even like in higher education, curriculums have 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 uh, have, um, uh, have adopted this kind of um, uh, approach on bio biophysical technology knowledge, um, especially with uh, some of the uh, with the NSCA standards of accreditation for SNC um, education programs. They're basically just based on curricular knowledge or scientific knowledge, um, and. Um, yeah, so so it's it, it's quite it, it's quite difficult for a um, uh, it's it's quite difficult for an SNC coach to be able to find appropriate development uh, strategies or appropriate opportunities to be able to develop some psychosocial behaviors. I mean, I was um, um, we were talked about this yesterday yesterday the day before. I was uh, very privileged to, uh, to do a talk at the NCA conference last I think it was last year in Washington, um, and uh, you know it really. It was it was great, um, and uh, and when I saw my my time slot, it was nine o'clock on Saturday morning, you know. So it it it, it I, I felt I felt valued that I was I was able to do that, but I also knew that I probably didn't have the right uh, response of people who could come and listen to it because the value at this stage on on on, on psychosocial behaviors or, on, or maybe developing on psychosocial behaviors not very high, because maybe people are ignorant or maybe people are just don't uh, don't don't know how how important these are yeah i think it's a more you know i, I don't find a whole lot of resistance from people when they're exposed to it it's more like yeah my, my curriculum didn't have those types of things you know and, yeah. and more that you know at least in the u.s context so the nsca was founded in 1978 i believe it was the official founding date um, if you guys are looking for a book by the way 
I'll hold it up here too. But there's a new book out called Strength Coaching in America. Not that that's really exciting or useful to see. It's probably upside down. But Strength Coaching in America by Shirley uh, Todd and Todd, historians of sport, proper historians. Uh, wrote, just wrote that book, and it's a, a lot of their research that appears in journals, they put it in the books and expanded upon it. Uh, but it gives the history of how Boyd Epley and other strength coaches at the time got together. And it was a strength conditioning coaching organization, but much like others, and this is again explained in uh, you know, sociological literature, that they used science then, they had to get science to justify what they did. If you think about the history of physical training, it was filled with a lot of, you know, now we, we call it myths or fallacies that right, weightlifting makes you slow and stiff, uh, makes you bulky and too big. And in order to debunk some of those things, uh, the practitioners needed the help of scientists to validate those thoughts, to val validate those beliefs. Uh, and sometimes, right, sometimes research validates, sometimes it refutes. And other times, it's more complex than that. Uh, but that's somewhat of the short history of it. Since then, right, the NSCA, others, UKSCA, the Australian uh, Strength Conditioning Association, and you, and you look at the comments in the chat about degrees and courses, the curriculums are heavy in biology, physiology, biomechanics, nutrition. To, and nutrition is newer. Um, if you guys follow the work, too, of like Nick Winkleman, motor learning is somewhat still marginalized. Uh, I had these classes as an undergrad, but it depends on how exercise si science, how exercise physiology, biomechanics heavy it is, compared to back in the old days before it was heavy in pedagogy. It was heavy in management and physical culture. A lot of the original phys ed degrees were called physical education and physical culture. And at least in the US, right, as physical education is tanked and people uh, and the schools have really uh, murdered at physical education, the sciences have become more dominant. Medical science, uh, athletic training, physical therapy, nursing, uh, science was almost synonymous with truth and justification and, and good, good knowledge, good research. Um, this is proper, this is desirable, we need to do these things. And, and so we can trace that history and you can also ask questions, oh gosh, man, how can we have all this good knowledge, this good science nowadays, and yet everybody keeps saying, like, right, we're obese, we're unhealthy, uh, we still have injuries, we're still getting hurt, right? Do we need more of the same things, or should we look at this thing differently? And those are the sort of, like, awkward questions that I like to pose. Do you want to find, find interesting is that that, that history, um, that history, uh, that those beliefs, um, you know, those... Um, um, this attitude and values that, that you, you come out of it, they, they, they guide the, uh, the, the learning strategies that these, uh, that, 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 that uh, SNC coach developers have, you know, have, have adopted. And so it's, it's a guide the structures of professional teaching, learning, and assessment, and, and, and how the best way of we, we teach this context specific uh, knowledge. And I think that's quite interesting to see that it's, it tends to be an instructor led, instructor -set centered. Um, to, uh, um, a coaching approach with uh, summative assessments at the end. And that's based on curriculas and, and the, the curriculas are adopted, uh, there can be evidence that you say that, and, and, and uh, they're based on that. And, and um, um, the professions, NSCA and UKSC have, have adopted that and for, for so far. And so we have, we have these, this approach um, going through the coach development programs that are currently there um, for, for, SNC, um, for SNC coaches. I, I just, uh, that is reflected in, in conferences, workshops, and professional journals and materials that's been sent out. Um, so th that approach is, effect, uh, is reflected in that. I'll, I'll add the observation. And this is where I love coaches because they make these observations. Um, and I just wish we had more people kind of writing about this uh, sort of thing because coaches will make good observations like, I wrote in the chat, just because you know a lot don't mean you can't coach, you know, something like that. It's usually articulated like that, right? You've got a lot of these smart people, but they can't coach. Well, what do they mean by that, right? What does that really mean? And how do, we, how do we think about that? And I use the word think like theorize. How do we theorize that? How do we think about that? And, and what it means is, right, you have somebody that has a lot of knowledge, usually of exercise science, so physiology, biomechanics, nutrition, 
those are the courses and they've had a year of anatomy, a year of physiology, additional coursework in bio, general biology and chemistry, but their interpersonal skills or pedagogical skills or procedural skills. These are words that mean similar things, right? Their ability to interact with, lead, engage, handle ambiguity, um, adjust to somebody's mindset, social identity, uh, organized space, all these things are more skills and behaviors than they are just knowing things. So Chris is talking about the um, ex explaining how we tend to kind of drive content knowledge or knowing stuff in curriculums, and you have to pass the exam or the certification exam in your demonstration of knowledge, but it's not a demonstration of skill or behavior or the ambiguity in the decision making that it reflects actual practice. That's true, yeah. And I think we, we're coming on to that now. Looking at it, um, you know, uh, I, one thing that we always say that, or that, that, that I hear so many times is that we want to have evidence based coaching practice. You know, and, and, and yeah, we can, we can pick out what we want and we can say, well, our, our, our coaching practice is evidence based when we have the bio, biophysical technolo technological knowledge, uh, exceptional knowledge and we are implementing that, it's evidence-based. But there is also evidence, and I think this is something that we've overlooked, there's also evidence that psychosocial skills uh, enhance um, uh, um, um, athletic, uh, athletes' development. And so if we, if we really want to be true to evidence-based coaching practice, we have to embrace both sides. And the, the one thing is that um, it's, it's often, often people feel, um, oh, what's the word? Um, well, I'm not saying that one side is better than the other. They complement each other. And that's what we've just trying, been trying to say, that it's, it's a complementation of both sides. The psychosocial behaviors that we talk about um, are a, a way of communicating the, uh, the, the biophysical technological knowledge to enhance the athlete. And I think that is the really important bit. So when we talk, talk about evidence-based coaching practice, we have to look at both sides. And quite often, we look at, uh, uh, when we look at um, the bio, bio, biophysical technological knowledge, we're thinking it's, uh, it tends to be very quantitative based. Um, so we have, an uh, we have an outcome, this is what I'm doing, okay, that's what, I'm gonna, that's, my, uh, um, that, that's what I've done, and this is the outcome, this is what's gonna be, do, what's gonna be happening. Okay, great. With the bio, if, um, um, psychosocial side, we tend to be looking at a lot of qualitative research which is not contradictive, it complements. Um, the, often, the problem that we have is that it's very difficult to assess or evidence um, some of the um, uh, psychosocial elements or qualitative behaviors. And, and so that's probably one of the reasons why it hasn't been adopted so much in the curricular development. But there are examples like motivation, identity, diversity, emotions, ethics, values, micropolitan powers that have been researched uh, in strength and conditioning. And I think we need to, we need to incorporate those um, within our coach development and in, in our coaching practice. Yep. So yeah, Dave, Dave uh, Hembro brings up a nice point too. Uh, and thanks Dave for live tweeting. I'm seeing the updates on, on my phone. <laughs> uh, but uh, right, like how come we don't theorize practice, practice-based models? And you know, I think there are ways. There's case study research, there's action research, uh, teachers, researchers approach, um, and, and there's very few in-depth, highly contextualized examples of practice-based evidence. Um, and often we don't give credit to practitioners too for informing even all forms of research that happen too. It's easy yeah. to laugh because it's easy to sit in a lab and use statistics to tweak something and make up a new variable and test it and have new technology and test it. And then we call that knowledge. But we, the, the, the scientists never often talk about external validity or transferability enough. It just becomes, because it was published, it becomes evidence-based practice. And we don't tend to evaluate or talk about it in a more robust way. And some of the, some of the evidence-based models talk about the client or the uh, person's practices and values, but we tend not to see those things uh, described in the field, or we don't fund that research, we don't produce that research, we don't promote that research, and so we don't see it or hear about it in the same light. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, just briefly before I move on to, I, I, I want to throw so a thinly veiled critique it. Like, for example, it's very popular to say exercise is medicine. And, I, and we get it, guys. It's nothing new. I mean, for thousands of centuries or thousands of years, people have been talking about uh, the health benefits of exercise. It's well known. And again, the idea of just saying exercise is medicine over and over again, if you look at the history of that and the problems of that, just saying it doesn't change behavior and it doesn't give, for example, it doesn't fix the horrible healthcare system that we have in the US. Uh, for the rest of you that are listening from around the world, I have a job at the University of Denver and my healthcare bill for me and my family a month that comes out of my paycheck is still like $700 a month. We have the most expensive healthcare system in the world and it provides us with terrible coverage. But you can keep telling me exercise is medicine. I was, I, I, it's the same thing, like, you know, like when we had this, this time where we in, in the lockdown, um, I try to get, get my kids to do, um, uh, to do a workout. Um, and uh, uh, who's that guy on the, on the oh, I forgot his name, but he does all the kids' workouts on YouTube. They loved him. You know, I do the same workout outside. They don't want to do it, but he's got the motivation. He can, he can, he, 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 he's, he brings across the emotions um, exactly the way they want it. And I think it's, we, we can say things or can we uh, uh, say things to people on, over and over again, the same as like strength and conditioning that, the same, that, that we can do to our athletes. But we have to find a way of implementing that. And that's done through psychosocial practice. Yeah. So do you want to mention that here on the... Where are we now? Okay, here we go. So what does practice look like at the moment? I think we talked about this a bit. Um, yes, we do have um, exception, and I, and I get that. We do have exceptional biophysical technology knowledge, and I think that's really, really important. Strength, power, agility, enhanced performance, reduced in injury, all this kind of stuff. That, 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 is, that is what we're all about. And then, and then, we, have, then we have this... Um, what the ICC has suggested, which is that we should be holistically developing the athlete and influencing their social, psychological, and physical well-being. Now, I find I, I'm just I just want to talk a little bit about the, about the, the position of an SNC coach. I think that's quite important. Quite often, um, we can marginalize ourselves because we're not part of the technical or not, not the, the technical coach who makes the selection and stuff like that. But in actual fact, we have a a very unique part because we're removed from the power dynamic that quite often is there between the technical coaches. So quite often the, 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 the athletes feel more inclined to be able to confide in you and to be, to be able to form a, a closer bond uh, or a better relationship with you because you don't have the same power, uh, power um, uh, dynamics. Now, if we have that unique position, we are in a position to be able to influence holistically the athlete. Now the problem here is that we are, we are, we are trying, we're trying to holistically influence the athlete in an elite sport and conference context where win-loss is everything. Now the ICC said we should, um, we should prefer or look at uh, positive interaction uh, instead of the win-loss um, percentage. Now I find that really, really difficult because um, if I don't um, get my athletes to win, they might be off the program and they don't want to be off the program. So it's, it's, it's a contradiction and it's quite hard to be in that position to, to be able to do that. So yes, psychosocial practice might encourage holistic development of the, of the asset, but also of the implement, implementation of uh, biophysical technolog technological knowledge. So keep that in mind that we always, it's not as simple as, as we think to be able to holistically athlete-centered coaching, all these buzzwords has come out, but no one really knows exactly what athlete-centered coaching is at the moment, but it's quite difficult to do that. So I, I just have been, you know, from, from where I'm at in my kind of life and career, I just wrote a paper uh, for a, a different journal, for a journal uh, sport coaching review. And I would encourage, like, we'll mention some of this stuff later on too, but sport coaching review publishes a lot of uh, interesting uh, psychosocial work and sport coaching, some in strength conditioning because there's folks like me too. But what do we mean in holistic development? Like whose holistic development are we talking about? 
Is it the coach imposing their view of holism on the athlete? You know, is it the coach's uh, values that have been, uh, they, that the coaches learned over years and within his culture? Um, to what extent does it, do we critique these things and develop our own identities and our own paths? And you can think about it, right? Like somebody will be talking about, you know, I used to listen to these people or I used to follow this, this training program and this is what I used to do. And now I do this, you know, and who knows, are you really being critical about these approaches and developing uh, and thinking about how the stress of that and trying to fit into a certain model or certain norm makes you or influences your behavior in kind of subtle ways. And the next thing you know, you get hurt or you've got a strain or you're like, man, I really like to take a day off, but I'm supposed to keep on grinding it out because uh, that's what they talk about, you know? Yeah. And so it's, it's a tension, right? It's a tension is a, not just a strength condition, but if you're a sport coach or somebody involved in athletic performance, you're constantly kind of thinking about the technical, tactical, physical, psychological team, you know, or social aspects, emotional aspects, just like now, right? Like whose periodization plan took account, took into account COVID in, pan, in a pandemic? Nobody's. So like the whole idea too, that you're going to periodize your program and plan to peak performance. And there are other people that critique this from a physiological stance, but just as a multivariable, highly contextual problem, I think it helps us to think about it using different language and be able to critique the language that we're kind of taught about periodization and annual plans and that kind of normative biophysical technological stuff. Absolutely, yeah. So. All right, we're going to keep it moving. We're doing a good job here, somewhat some pace. Yeah. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit about the, the uh, opportunities to learn and how they're going to be learned. And there are three main uh, uh, learning theories. And I'm not going to be going into too much detail about it. You're going to get the slides and look at it. But the first two, behaviorism and cognitive, cognitivism, are basically the one that has to have been adopted and underlying uh, the signature pedagogies of, of uh, of uh, our organizations. Um, now, constructivism is a, is a learning theory that uh, looks at uh, uh, constructive subjective uh, reality based on previous knowledge and objective reality. Um, so it's, it's, it's looking at um, uh, uh, learning through experiences. So uh, it's, it's, it's mind dependent, it's subjective. So we are constructing our, our truth as we, um, as we uh, construct our, uh, as we, um, think about and reflect about our experiences and our relationship with others. So that's another way of learning. And that kind of constructivist learning theory has not really been adopted in, in curricular development or indeed in, um, in, in higher education programs. Now, there, there is somehow, in, in some of them, like some, some medical professions, they have adopted some and have adopted it to some degree because there are a lot of placements uh, where they, where the the, med, uh, the the doctor needs to write reflective statements and and is uh, mentored um, and has a community of practice that they can uh, that they are part of. However, in within strength and conditioning, the reality really is we are we're getting we're we're, we're going to get accredited. We might get a master's, and and if we don't if we don't um, do any practical uh, volunteering work in between, our first job. In a, in, in a big organization or in any organization is the one we're going to be doing working with actual athletes. And, and that's quite difficult. So, so from a constructivist uh, learning, learning um, um, paradigm, if we look at this, then we're thinking of maybe incorporating some strategies that help us learn from our experience throughout our development as coaches, not only as novice coaches, but throughout our development or our, our, our um, uh, continuous personal development for some of the organizations. Okay. So we have something like reflective practice. I mean, if you look at reflective practice, it's been used in various, various other professions and it's been encouraged in, uh, uh, in strength and conditioning. Um, and you can, you can have those references uh, if, you, if you send us an, send us an email. No. Um, we, we actually, I remember we actually had everybody's email, so I'll just send it out afterwards. Oh, yeah. fantastic. 
So, so we're looking at that. The, the one thing with reflective practice, and you might say, well, you know what, I'm a reflective practitioner. I reflect after every, uh, after every session. There's a skill to reflection. And if you look at some of the learning theory of reflection, Moon uh, and Schoen, uh, we're, we're looking at, we need to be able to critically reflect, to be able to change our behavior on good coaching practice and bad coaching practice alike. And that critical reflection uh, requires someone to facilitate uh, and guide you in this process. So that's quite important. I'm, I'm going to interject real quick, Chris. Uh, yep. What we see here too, and, and I, I'm going to point this out, we see somebody here reflecting in like a mirror, right? And this is what we often think about reflection, is that it should mirror and you should reflect and kind of understand yourself, reflect back and see the same thing. There are other people that don't believe in this particular sort of reflection, that they they say, hey, okay, yes, I understand, that's good, that's a good type of reflection, but are you reflecting to reproduce and reinforce the same old thinking, or is that reflection advancing you in some other way? So uh, I saw it on Twitter today too, Lauren Downham uh, just came out, and I'll say the International Sport Coaching Journal uh, with their fancy editor, I think she's on the call, is Dr. Callery. Um, this was just published in the ISCJ Journal, and it's a great paper uh, about a more critical approach to reflection. If you're reflecting or being taught to reflect and just reinforce and strengthen what you already know and to, you know, like regurgitate fundamentals, fundamentals, or got to squat, got to squat, you know, lift big, run fast, run fast, you know, or just like these kind of things. You just uncritically say it. It's more of like this mirror model. But Lauren's paper is from her dissertation study. Again, it was in International Sport Coaching Journal is a more critical approach to reflection that approaches it differently. So I just want to add that. Yeah, yeah I totally agree with that. Totally agree. I think that, that that's really important. Internship, again, that's something that it, it's quite important. I find um, uh, an internship is a great way of, of, of learning. The problem with internship, especially um, within the UK, um, the, there are not specific guidelines to internship. Um, and so there are there are problems with 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 internship and with, with how much you're going to learn. So it's needs it's important to, to be able to set internship up so that there are learning outcomes of these psychosocial practices that can be obviously uh, combined with reflective practice as well and mentorship, which we're coming on to now. And I, I guess yeah, again to to extend and and go in a different direction. The idea that formal internships or setting up an internship a certain way, you know, is better. We actually don't have any literature and strength conditioning to support that that I know of. You know, in fact, so Mary, Dr. Mary Kay Fight at Springfield is actually studying this now for a dissertation. And right. I believe, if I say it correctly, some of our research has shown that the formal internships are no better uh, in, in enhancing like self-esteem or self-efficacy, something like that. So. We live in an age too where everything and coaches love to be in control of things and they love to have now a formal internship because they're not trying to get you to think necessarily, but they're trying to indoctrinate you or get you to understand how they approach things. And again, I'm not saying what they're doing is bad, but I'm saying that's the system. That's what's going on. And we say these things and my approach is to be like, well, all right, let me see the evidence on that. And how about we do more evidence in different ways too not just reinforce or say the same old things. And, and we can relate this to the NSCA and other accrediting bodies that have internship experiences and requirements, but sometimes it's, it's just a thing. And they're not actually doing any research, but they just require it anyway. Well, you should be doing research then. If you believe in evidence-based practice, you should be doing some evidence, some sort of evidence in a variety of ways to know more about this and have a better understanding of it. You know, and I can say the same thing with mentoring and all the things that we're going to yeah. do. There's different approaches to it. Well, absolutely. I mean, you, yeah, you, you could say the same thing. It's because they, uh, in, in, if, they're all, um, if, if they're all guided by the values and attitudes of, um, performance, of elite sports and performance coaches, then that's exactly what's going to happen. And I think, we, it, a, again, there needs to be almost like a, a change to a degree in some of the values and attitudes that inform this internship and this mentoring chip, the, the mentoring side of it. Um, now, I find that uh, 
maybe that's just me, but I find I've come across a lot of, of, a lot of uh, lead coaches that hold, every, hold everything very close and are not open because they are in a, in, in a, in a good job and they don't want to lose it. So that's the way they treat their interns. That's the way they mentor. That's the way they, they conduct the reflective practice. It's on their terms. Now, for me, uh, my values and uh, uh, beliefs are that I would like to see my interns to become a better coach than I am. Um, now, that's, that's very philo philosophical. Um, and I've got, got probably quite a secure job where I am. Whereas in the elite sport, if they don't win medals, you'll be out of a, jo out of a job. So it's all governed by, by, by uh, the attitudes and belief that of, of, the, of, the, of the, the coaches who are behind the coaches you are working with. And so this is, this is quite important. So to, to sum and wrap up, and we're starting to, yeah, we'll have a little bit of uh, time for some question and answer discussion. John's kicking us off good uh, in a good direction here. Uh, I just checked, and this isn't just a plug, plug, plug uh, promote our book, but um, I did see that Rutledge is still having this sale. It's part of their COVID sale. If you guys are looking for any of the books that we come out, uh, I see Phil Hancock is on the on the call too. He's one of the co-authors of our Understanding Strength Conditioning and Sport Coaching book that just came out last week, actually. Uh, and then Dr. Callery and I co-edited this other book too. Um, so if you're looking for work on learning theory and, and psychology and sociology, of strength conditioning, you know, there's some uh, resources here, as well as Chris has done, you know, probably the best work I think to date on, uh, you know, how coaches learn, strength conditioning coaches learn and develop uh, in the field and, and different measures of, uh, you know, their effectiveness. Cool. Yeah. So, quick? Yeah. go for it. Bro. I'll tell you what, let me see if we can stop the screen share. What do we see now? If you guys have any questions, I'll go ahead and unmute some mics or if we'll look at anybody who's raising their hand and I'll unmute you or something like that. Or if you got a question, go ahead and jump in there. Chris, if you want to read a comment in the chat or something, maybe you're all, I'm clicking buttons here. Delia Corner says, these examples of learning include a heavy dose of decision-making. In order to be able to experience this, we need to be in a position where we can make the wrong decision, experience the consequences, and despite that, continue. Good, yeah. So in like higher education, we might call this like the safe space. You need a safe space or a, a, a micro-teaching place to be able to do this. And part of the problem is that we throw students out onto internships without having done, done, done this in the classroom or we don't reflect on their internship experience, you know, and then they either get thrown to the, you know, wolves or they get cast aside because they don't have the skills to do these types of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll respond real quick to the tacit knowledge internship thing. I, Alex and to John too, I think, for me, I think it's odd that so much of what we do is tacit, on-the-job, experiential learning. I mean, if, if you take like medicine, they don't like teach it out of a textbook and then let you start doing surgery. You have to do the skills, right? You have to do the skills and demonstrate the skills to put in a tube or a line. Like these are very behaviorist-oriented type of things. You can demonstrate the skill in, the, in, in practice. Now, I understand other, some groups do this in their certification, and you do this in internships and on the job, but we should be teaching that more, I think, at the university with an undergraduate degree. And some places do, but it's a little bit messier to assess. It takes more time, and quite frankly, it takes somebody that knows how to do that and can or evaluate it, and that's not the same as like the bench scientist that may not have those skills. And so, it's a it's a really a transformational shift of higher education too. I think you're absolutely right there. So uh, if you look at higher education programs, often often they are they are set up. The people who are set up the program leaders are biomechanists, physiologists, nutritionists. So when it comes to a skill like like let's just think about a skill of uh, of uh, coaching and an Olympic lift. Um, now I've, I get some of my interns that they work with me come from MSc programs. And they said, I'm not comfortable with um, 
coaching an Olympic lift. And I said, well, I don't want you to be comfortable. I want you just to coach the Olympic lift so you get the skills to be able to coach them. And let me observe it. And, 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 and we can reflect on how, how, how it went and see how it goes. It's very difficult because the assessments are still just based on, on tick point exercises of uh, how you can instruct a, a puppet that can move exactly right. And so that's the, that's the difficult part. And, and not a lot of people in the coaching world or in, uh, coaches uh, allow um, novice coaches the freedom to actually just go ahead and do it. Well, I'd say, so I look at it kind of twofold. And the one thing I'd say, you know, it's funny in the classroom or like if I had a team, you know, you wouldn't tell the athlete like, hey, go play a game. And that's how you'll learn how to play. You would, you'd have a breakdown, like a regressed part whole model. Um, so it's interesting a lot having been an intern and now being a C coach in the college setting in the States where it's like, yeah, it very much is, you know, it's, it's, it's this observational learning. You're expected to just kind of pick up on it randomly and then go do it. But it's like you said, yeah, where it's, it's not a, we don't spend enough time with the skill acquisition of here's how you communicate with people. Here's how to, how to teach this. And you're going to come across, you know, it's, it's this blanket. Every athlete is one size fits all uh, versus like, Hey, some people are going to have to, you know, it's a, there's a dialogue, right? Some people you have to address this way. Some people address that way. Some people learn better uh, internal, external queuing, stuff like that. And so there's no, there's no build up to it. It's just, here's how the body works and go express the skill. There's no skill acquisition to it. Um, so it's just an interesting way to kind of look at it. Like you would never do that. Like you said, in the medical field, you'd never do that uh, in a classroom. And you'd never do that with a team. You'd never tell your athletes, go play this sport you've had, that you've read about, or maybe you've seen one time. And you know what I mean? So it's just, an, you guys bring up a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with, agree, agree with you, Krista. That's absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I, I think too, that's one of the problems. Like I was on the NSCA committee about the fundamental lifts course. And we put that together and it's a really nice course about learning how to lift. But we, we floated the idea also of doing a next course on periodization. And I said, absolutely not. Like just stay away from it because it's going to be a disaster. And we don't have the right people in the room, in, including myself, uh, to think about how to do a more complex decision making process like that. And it's going to be a, 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 an argument on the committee. People are going to hunker down into their silos. It's too messy. It's too complex. It's not a discrete kind of skill. So it doesn't work under the same logic. Don't go there right now. You know, and they haven't. And that's why you're seeing like the advanced periodization clinic and that kind of stuff online and virtual stuff uh, because it's different. We, we haven't figured out the nuance of learning theory, uh, instructional strategies, and assessment in strength and conditioning sport coaching. We still talk about it in a much kind of too big of a broad picture. And then we end up with problems, too, like you've identified, um, that giving the feedback, the type of cueing, that's one discrete skill, but also programming, reflective practice, adjustment. Those are now tacit, implicit, experiential things. Like we learn that on the job, you know, and try to do our best. And we have no way to understand a more complex thought process. And that's part of the problem. So... To, uh, yeah. what do you got? Read that one. I'll respond. I saw a question here about research too. Uh, so one of the projects like myself and Dr. Cucklick are working on is breaking down YouTube videos on strength and conditioning coaches uh, to do a critical analysis of what the coaches are saying and doing in the video. Uh, what are the practices they're doing? And relating that back to uh, the literature and the research on coaching practice is one of the things we're doing. Uh, we just did an intervention study with a few strength coaches too to help them actually engage in a more robust decision-making thought process about uh, how to change uh, their coaching practice, how to move athletes around differently to enhance performance and solve some new problems. Um, I think that's kind of like, for me, that's hardcore psychosocial work. Uh, and it's, it's nice in the psychology, sociology of coaching. I think some other basic things in strength conditioning too would be, uh, it's not the be all end all, but even just doing simple correlational studies. And I'm a big hardcore qualitative interview, observation, ethnography kind of guy, but let's just take basic stuff and showing how 
certification matters, how education matters, uh, how the coaches who have some sort of education and training can reduce injuries, enhance outcomes. You know, we've, we've just started to scratch the surface on those kind of things. Uh, and that would go a long way to showing the value of a better prepared, because I don't think we're there even to, because uh, I want to go further than, than we currently are. Uh, but that's one stepping stone on that path. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to answer Phil's question. Yeah, I think we do kind of a bit, Phil, and, and, it, and it's slow. I hope to be doing this, you know, for a long time to come. I'm um, having a great time, uh, you know, and uh, we've got students, uh, you know, a few of them on the call, there's about three or so or four on the call that are thinking and asking different questions. And you have to then help them uh, develop the writing skills and the presentation skills to articulate this stuff uh, and write in, uh, my own work has only been in the last 10 years. Uh, I feel like it's been longer and it's not. Uh, Chris's work too is only in the last, what, five, three, it's three, years, four yeah. years? Yeah, five years. Yeah, five years. Um, it's, 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 I mean, I, I remember when I first started uh, asking the question uh, and uh, within the UK SCA, within their members, I, I got blank looks. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and now, um, quite a few are interested in the research and are interested in psychosocial um, skills and behaviors and how to develop them. And, and there are now, um, I know that I think it's uh, Sheffield Holland, Dave, I think your your MSC is, is called MSC in Strength and Conditioning Coaching. So I quite like that because there's an emphasis on coaching. So it's one of the only one in, in the country that and it's not an MSc in strength and conditioning, you know, where you get to know as an MSc in strength and conditioning coaching. And there are uh, elements that the, uh, uh, the coach has to, has to do in, in, in ways of learning the psychosocial behaviors, which is for me really encouraging because uh, I like to have a, a coach coming out of an institution be able to know how to deal with people, really, to know how to instruct um, uh, athletes. So that's just, just really encouraging to be able to see some of that research actually being uh, integrated into what we call evidence-based practice. So, I, I'll mention real quick too to address Tim's kind of question here too, is that, um, you know, some of my work as well as Chris's work too, uh, is very actually con highly contextualized. As social scientists, I think you'll find that mo a lot of our approaches at least are not abstract, just, you know, basic research or generic kind of experimental or statistical research. They're actually reflections about our actual practice or working with other people to show the difference that makes some practice. So to be very specific on one, um, I asked a athlete, and I, I wrote about this, I asked an athlete about, when I was a strength coach at Tennessee, I asked a young man on the football team, uh, African-American, I said, hey, tell me what it's like to be a black man on a predominantly white campus. And uh, it's no surprise too, right? Especially with recent events. I mean, this week in the U.S., racism is, exists. It's a thing. And, and I was studying sociocultural things in grad school, and I, and I didn't really know how to do this, right? How does a white coach ask a, uh, you know, 20-year-old black male? And you, and you have to be careful about that too, because I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm asking him to speak, you know, for, on behalf of everybody as well as impose more stress upon him. But the conversation seemed to be very open-ended and very well received. Now, what difference does that make to anything? Does, did that help him squat? Uh, I don't know on that day that it really helped improve his performance, but I know that how we interacted after that was different. And that I think there was a level of respect and nuance to our relationship at that point uh, because of the culturally sensitive pedagogy and the critical race theory work that I was reading that how I approached and how I saw his experience and then how I might program design differently or take into account various forms of stress and other things in his life. Okay. Uh, and I can think of a similar example in Mississippi when I was coaching down there and I would ask you know, the high school kids I was working with, you know, why are they doing that? Have they tried this? And we would just sometimes play some games and do other things. Whereas before 
the coaches were very rigid and very structured to the point where everything was blowing a whistle and having them do something like they were in the military. And, you know, I like, like guys, like, don't they want to have fun and be around the coach and that, you know, they look up to you. Let's like chill out with that and let's have a good time and do things kind of a little bit more informally. So that influenced our practice, right? They're spending more time now and they're having a great time. I would think that's a win. Oh, that's a good question uh, from, from Adam. Uh, Chris, uh, having read your research on an athlete's perception of effective SNC coaching, is there any research that gives insight as, as, as if to these perceptions change when the athlete is a youth athlete or an athlete uh, within a talent and development environment? If not, would you, perceive, would you see these perceptions changing? Uh, that, that is a, that is a, it's a great, it's an absolute great question, that is. Absolute great question. Um, uh, and the answer is, I don't know. I think it would be great to do some, it, it would be great to do some research in it. I've, I've used elite athletes. Um, some, some of them, uh, yeah, they were elite um, university-based athletes. So they were also studying. Um, uh, and there might be, a, again, youth sport, um, currently as youth sport stands, It's, it's uh, especially within the UK, there's a big emphasis on, on participation uh, and uh, on uh, having fun and all this stuff that, 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 that Brian just mentioned. Now, um, if you're going to, I, I can only assume, but it, it, it would be an interesting study to find out whether youth, how, how youth actually perceive that. There's a short answer to some extent, right? We need more research specific to strength conditioning because the social science on strength conditioning is minuscule. But yeah. in sport coaching and athletes, yes, right? With, with Dr. Calorie on the call, like with Chris, we got like uh, she studies uh, masters athletes and their experiences and their preference and their motives for participation are different than youth. Yeah. So uh, the idea that youth to elite level or collegiate pro to masters, all, you know, 35 plus change, yes. <laughs> yes uh i was gonna be scolded here quickly if i did not mention that um but, you know but it, it's it's that, that's it has to to a degree yeah well i mean that's why, that, that's why we explore different contexts i mean that's why we, we're doing research in strength and conditioning otherwise we could have just said well let's take all the coaching research and apply it to strength and conditioning because it's coaching yeah. so it's a different environment it's different people um, so, you know, there are uh, context uh, specific. So it'd be very interesting to, to find out with regards to strength and conditioning, how they change, but I'm sure they would. Yeah. And, and the, you know, I'm thinking uh, the uh, uh, specific to uh, strength conditioning, I could coach at Tennessee, you know, and we have personal trainers on the call too, right? That I worked with the football team and the norm was too very disciplinary and I've written about it, right? We tell them what to do. They do it. If they don't, we yell at them, we cut them, we, we discipline them. I would also later in the day then work with uh, coach Fulmer or early in the morning, I'd work with coach Fulmer, the head football coach. Do you dare think I talk to the football coach, the head football coach the same way uh, who was 60 years old as I would talk to a 20 year old athlete, not even close. Uh, now I would like express dissatisfaction if he wasn't working hard, but how I did it was quite differently. Um, and I've, I've personal trained and worked with some older adults as well and considered that. And again, they're not athletes and, and right. Athletes have to transition out of that athletic mindset too, in order to kind of live their non-athletic lives. So yes, uh, we need more of that. Uh, Alex had mentioned too about legitimizing strength conditioning. So again, I think I was looking at, and one of the things Chris and I are working on is kind of multi-level proposal of how to do some of this work and that we need to, one, have better accountability um, and better standards and, and accountability to those standards. We need to make and have the evidence that this is a public health issue and that there's a safety issue, not to just strengthen our own control, but to show that we really need to have better prepared strength condition practitioners out there, period. And that to some degree, not foolproof, because it'll never be 100% and it never is, and that's fool's goal. But we need to show that we can prepare people for practice better and it, it'll help the public good. If we don't make that argument or have that evidence, then it gets hard to make it a profession that then regulates itself and uh, has 
clear and documented standards. That's easier said than done too. That's a massive kind of problem. Yeah. You know, if you think about a hundred years ago, right? We didn't have the same standards as we do now for physicians or engineers. And people have made this argument in strength conditioning too, but making the argument to mobilizing action and advocacy and structural social change is two different things. I think uh, Dave's got a nice little question here. I'm interested in SSC for social and personal development outside of athlete envi environment. For example, I have a project where we are putting weight lifting kit in a youth club and teaching the youth workers to coach lifting. Any thoughts on this uh, as an approach or examples of uh, other similar approaches or projects? Um, I, I per personally, I have, I, I have not been involved, but I've, I've known of a um, uh, weightlifting club around the corner, but who I um, uh, work with very closely. And she, she goes into, in, now into, into schools as well. And she works with school children and, and they absolutely love it. And I think it, it, is, it is certainly something with regards to um, um, uh, using strength and conditioning. Um, yeah, say? outside an athlete environment uh, that works and that, that, uh, that generates, um, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's the work of Hellison. I'm trying to remember. It's like, I always get it confused. It's either TPSP, PTSP, personal and social responsibility framework, as well as like the positive youth development framework, uh, those types of things. And you could, I would love to see more, you know, like when Dave writes too, I think about developing or having re environment rich resources where you have sidewalks or, you know, the, the, the county or the local government would somehow provide a, a local kit or something like that too, to give to people to help them be fit. Uh, I bet you the, that sort of investment would return multifold on the an original investment. That if you gave and provided those things, people will ultimately be healthier uh, and live longer lives and have less injuries and less burden on the healthcare. So economically, it would make sense. Since a lot of places don't do that. From what I understand about like you know, the US as well as England to some extent, they just don't make those investments. Um, great, can I, um, I'm just gonna answer Alan's um, comment. That's, that's, that's a really good one. How can coach behavior be changed? Just giving coaches more knowledge, even if it's knowledge about psychosocial topics, will most likely not change much. As behavior change is rarely caused by more or new knowledge. Absolutely correct. Um, we call it um, the knowledge to action gap, which is something that is, that is, that is out there. It's, 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 it's especially, it comes from the medical side, where well, there's so much knowledge, uh, yet it's not been implemented. And that is the most important bit. We need to implement the knowledge. And the same way that we have to apply our biophysical technological knowledge, we have to develop the skills or the knowledge that may, for example, if we find out, um, if, we, if we find out that uh, our motivational strategies are not up to date or for, for a specific athlete, we need to develop that. That it's no point knowing about it, but we need to develop it. That's again is something that we need to take ownership of and do. And I think um, I, what I find that um, I, I did a recent, a recent study which I haven't written up yet, but it's about reflect a reflective practice um, and a four week reflective practice study where um, I, I let a facilitate facilitated reflection where the coach uh, reflected daily, and I facilitated that reflection, guided them into critical levels of reflection. And one of, the, one of the topics that came up was that they, uh, when, when the coach felt accountable to, um, when the coach felt accountable to the facilitator, he was forced to be able to change their behavior accordingly. So there's a, there's a way of accountability that, that has to be, in, not enforced, but has to be maybe implemented somehow into the way we can develop our coaching practice. And that's just really important because purely knowledge, knowledge is great. We can all have knowledge, but we can still do the same thing if we, there's no accountability. So reflective practice is a, a useful tool to do that, but it needs to be an accountability. You can, you can have the same through a community of practices, for example, you know, where, you, where you, you would say something like, okay, this is what I want to work at uh, over this period of time. And you have accountability from other people that say that, that's, hey, Come on, Chris, what have you done about it? Okay, 
Well, not much. Okay, so let me try this. Um, so, so th these kind of accountability and working together, I think it's really, really important. Ryan, have you got anything to add for that? On that? Uh, no, I mean, right, like, you know, we're going to open up a can of worms, too, of, you know, kind of behavioral techniques, you know, reflective, oh, yeah, yeah. Cognitive, situated cognition, uh, experiential learning and reflective practice, you know, act or mindfulness-based approaches, psychoanalytic approaches, existential approaches, you know, we can go on. Again, you know, the idea, too, like, I'll just I'll stop with this, the idea that behavior change is like a thing, like we can just kind of do it, is generally not how it works, too, because it's so complex, and people are more complex than that. Um, there are some researchers that look for quick fixes and they might have some success in that. It just depends on what somebody's problem or what they're trying to change too. Um, so, and there are quite a few behavior uh, change theories. Uh, I mean, if you look at it, uh, I, I, I think they're like over hundred. So. And so you can, you can, you can look at them and thinking, well, whatever one applies and that's quite, quite, quite something. So great, terrific guys. I just want you know, I've got it up here on the screen again. If you guys want to interact on uh, social media, the email after the chat, we'll figure out how to share a link to the video. If you guys want it, share it with other people or watch it again. We'll send you some references and the stuff that we kind of referred to in the slides and that kind of stuff too. Uh, but otherwise, I think that'll do it. Uh, if there are other ideas and things that you want to see or are curious about, uh, I know that uh, myself and you know, Chris, others and our collaborators, uh, people we can reach out to, we are really, I think, advocating for more of this work in general. Uh, so if there's ideas, send it over, uh, you know, any way you like, and we'll try to help uh, put some more things together and continue this good work. So absolutely appreciate your time. and Thanks for dropping in, everybody. Thank you so much. Nice to talk to you all.